<laughs> so I want to unpack a little bit of what Chris just uh, showed us, and so and so we can kind of get a real sense of bringing it home to Baltimore, and also just we know that we've been in sort of crisis mode for a long time with gay men, and particularly in black gay men. So this is something that we've seen for the last 20 years. But we also want to think about a couple of things. We have the tools in our toolbox to help us move forward. And I think right now we're in such a, at a critical juncture where we can use all of these tools to work ourselves out of this. Now, I don't know if we can treat ourselves out of the epidemic, mm. but I do think that we have to begin thinking about how we can use those new tools to get us there, as well as addressing the structural violence issues that Chris brings up. And, and a key thing that I want to make sure that I also um, talk about today uh, in this context is really the Affordable Care Act because mm -hmm. it's something that comes up every time I give a talk or go visit an organization um, in this area. It's something that I constantly am asked about. So I want to make sure I un un unwrap some of the mythology around, around the magical thinking of the Affordable Care Act today. And so first in Baltimore, Baltimore in general is an under-resourced resource community. And so HIV is not just th thriving in black gay men in Baltimore, it's thriving in the general black community in Baltimore. So I think there is something to say about looking across cities where HIV is high in numbers. Clearly black gay men are leading the infections and also the AIDS deaths in Baltimore, but it's a crisis across the black community in Baltimore just to kind of encapsulate where we are. And at the same time, when we look at structural violence, so we, when we think about things like access to housing and access to employment and ongoing education and safe spaces for these individuals in the community to utilize resources, Baltimore has a dearth of all of these resources across the board, particularly for a national city with the prominence of Baltimore. You don't see those services that are comparable in other cities. So I think it's very important to think about when we talk about some of these mythology again of why folks are in these situations, we have to just look at some of the basic needs that are not being met in people's everyday lives that put them in situations where they can't access care. And we have to identify those. We have to think about, again, why are there not spaces across the city where LGBT youth can, work, can go and, and be mentored and have safe experiences and have this sort of youth development model that puts them in a better place where they can make better decisions. And we also have to think about the broader situation Situation. If we just have a cadre of young people who are healthy on the right, on the west side, for example, but the children on the east side are not receiving the same type of care, when we come together, we're still going to have, we're still going to have that same syndemic situation unfolding before us, which is really what's happening. We're seeing the social networks merging. We're seeing these issues unfold, regardless of class, regardless of location, regardless of income. We see all of these things still kind of manifesting in the black community in that way. And as we think about moving forward, you know, we have things like pre-exposure prophylaxis. We have things like post-exposure prophylaxis. We have now at-home HIV testing where you can get an HIV test at the drugstore and the, uh, test at home in the privacy of your home. These are all tools that, if all things being equal, would help us stem this issue. But all things are not equal. And so as we think about having those tools, we have to remember that community is where science and policy hits the road, right? It's where all of these things get implemented. And so as we think about things like the Affordable Care Act, we have to remember that the Affordable Care Act is not going to change most circumstances for how people access care. The Affordable Care Act is not going to alter people who already have health insurance who are not going to get tested for HIV. It's not going to change the fact that we still have to actually get out kinks of who's on Ryan White, who mm -hmm. cannot utilize Ryan White. There are, there's all sorts of situations with insurance that inhibit people accessing care. And when you think about insurance at the first time of diagnosis, one thing that we know is that over 80% of the people who are diagnosed in the United States at first diagnosis of HIV do not have private health insurance. They're relying on Medicaid or Medicare 
and or Ryan White to receive their HIV services. And so, of course, one of the wonderful things about Ryan White that I want to kind of put out there is that Ryan White covers people who are undocumented. As where the Affordable Care Act currently will not be covering undocumented individuals, Ryan White actually does because it takes into this concept <coughs> that structural violence around those situations is really putting those people at risk for HIV. So to in the spirit of sort of switch points, I want to sort of use a story to illustrate some things that are going on in Baltimore, particularly um, with uh, black gay men. And I want to talk about a project that I'm currently working on with um, the black, uh, with one of the black communities here um, of gay men in the house and ballroom community. I know some of you may not be familiar with that term, but essentially, it's a it's a subgroup of of, of men in the community and transgender individuals in the community who come together to form social networks. In a sense, I want to say that many of these social networks are formed because they're a dearth of the other resources that I previously described. So if there are not spaces where people can come together and socialize in safe ways, if there are not available mentors, people sometimes seek these groups and seek access to these groups to gain those resources, to gain, to gain that guidance in those areas of their lives. So we're fortunate in Baltimore that we do have these groups for people to come together and to actually work together. But in these same spaces, we have to think about development and past moving forward. And so a lot of people in the public health world often critique some of the, um, the outcomes that are affiliated with being a member of these types of, of houses or organizations because the, the actual public health outcomes are abysmal. Um, when you look across these groups, many of the men have HIV, many of the transgender individuals have HIV. You see skyrocketing rates of syphilis. You see tuberculosis at, high, <laughs> tuberculosis at higher rates than normal in the populations. In some cities, we're even seeing malaria and meningitis in these populations. But at the same point, these are often the only structures in these cities that will support these individuals in the way that they need to be supported. And when you get all of those circumstances in these houses, in these groups, it creates this storm that is very hard to unpack. And we're not just talking about young people, per se, in small groups. These are historical issues that have been in these cities for decades and decades and decades. So we're not going to unpack some of these issues simply by addressing access to HIV treatment or access to syphilis treatment. We have to be mindful that we also have to begin laying out pathways for people to utilize these tools. It's not enough for us just to make it available. We have to understand how people interact with the services to make sure that they're utilizing the services and also really making sure that the outcomes that we're having clinicians be a part of the outcome there where they have to be accountable for implementing these things in ways that are meaningful. If we have PrEP available in communities, so the treatment for HIV that can prevent HIV in uninfected individuals, if we have this available, we have to think about why is it that young people who are at high risk for HIV are not being put on this medication? What are the ethical issues around not suggesting that? And why can we not make it available? Why do we not have the political will to really unpack that we have this tool that can help many people and have had it now as a CDC recommended guideline, I believe, mm -hmm. since 2011? Why has this not been pushed into communities to help protect young people, particularly sexual minority youth? At the same point, when we know that in some cities we have models where the city health department has been in such disarray that they have granted local LGBT youth organizations their own health clinics to treat young people at no cost. And so we have to begin to think about political will in various cities. And I'm not going to name out any particular partners in Baltimore. But I think that we do have to unpack who are the key players that are pushing for HIV. And HIV is a very divisive disease. It separates gay from straight. In the black community, we're also talking men from women. There's a lot of things that have to be unpacked. And it's also about resources. There's a lot of money that funnels, funnels into our cities, 
into our hospitals around treatment and access to these sort of resources. And I think we also have to be mindful that sometimes what, when what we've been doing has not worked, we have to shift. And shifting resources is a very difficult discussion to have when you've got lots of employees, when people are dependent on those resources. But if we have seen that in many cities across the country, what we've been doing has not been working, at what point do we make that shift? At what point do we demand that novel and innovative things are rolled out to the community? When do we begin to say that it's time for local new ideas to be brought into the, into the mix here? Particularly in Baltimore, and I think many of you who do work in the city, you know there's a dearth of young leadership around these, e these issues. And so, and not just around HIV, around issues across the board. And so I think that it's very key that as we unpack again, how we address these issues, we have to understand that there has to be leadership on the ground. Uh, individuals like Chris and myself can give lecture after lecture, but at some point, the rubber has to meet the road in community organizations, and people have to have the will to do the work. We just can't rely on Johns Hopkins or University of Maryland to do this work. We have to have enough on the ground community activism to make it really effective. And we have to understand all of the, the dynamics that are placing people at risk. Baltimore has one of the highest youth HIV infection rates in the country. And I don't think that's by happenstance. That's because we have the perfect storm here again to where youth are, we have enough people who are not on treatment of all ages that are then creating this situation that's very unfortunate for you. But we also know that we have the opportunity to stop that. And so I think we're, we can talk some more in our discussion about the ways that that can unfold, because I don't want to ramble. But I think that we definitely are at a turning point when we either demand that these issues be unpacked at a local level and that these resources be switched to really address the need or we will continue to play party politics and distribute money to each individual group who wants to see things unfold in a certain way. We have to put funding where it needs to be for the populations who need the funding most. I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you.